Lucy Stagerwald, it's so nice to see you. It's lovely to be here. We met one time, I guess, um, but this is really sort of our more, more or less our second meeting, right? I believe so, yes. But I listen um, to your podcast on Liberty.me, which is hugely popular. I'm glad. I'm. I'm glad that you approve. That's. Um, I like the approval of my libertarian betters, even if that offends the left libertarians with its latent bossism. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> bossism, yeah. A funny word. <laughs> it is a funny word. I'm kind of okay with it. I'm not gonna lie. But well. Yeah, I know what you mean. I I feel this way of uh, the left libertarians. It's easy to caricature their views until you actually read the writings, and then. Yeah, it's pretty interesting stuff. You know, I like I like the challenge. I don't think of myself as a right libertarian in any case. So. No, me neither. I don't like having a wing. I love the left libertarians. I met a lot at um, Students for Liberty in February. Uh, they're fantastic. Um, I don't. I'm not with them. But as as you say, I don't feel like a right libertarian by any means either. I don't really yeah. get the picking a wing thing. Right. Well, the other, the other thing is that sometimes people say, well, what is a left libertarian? And it's hard to kind of put your finger on it entirely. Yeah, I guess it's a certain sensitivity to certain causes and issues and things like that. But, uh, yeah, there's such diversity. It, it seems almost wrong to kind of, you know, clump them all, all into one category and say, oh, the left libertarians think such and such, you know. There seems yeah, like a lot true. of diversity there. I've been accused of being a left libertarian just because I said I prioritized... Um, the prison and cops and war stuff. Um, some uh, not very charming libertarian on the internet once told me I was left because of that, but I don't think that that followed at all. It's just that, you know, the the the, the most obvious uh, life and death and uh, freedom or not issues are kind of important, most important to me. Right. Well, you know, uh, Lucy, there was it wasn't too long ago when libertarians weren't really talking about uh, cops and uh, the uh, police issues and things like that that much. I mean, the, it, this has become this is a rather new thing. Uh, I don't I don't know. You're you're probably not old enough to remember this, but but I remember a time when a sort of minimalist state ideology kind of created a sort of tolerance on the part of libertarians towards the police. All of which has come to a, an end, essentially, since 2008. Um, yeah, and I don't know my libertarian history as fully. I have some missing spots. It's usually the 90s where I was, you know, a kid. <laughs> um, and I also don't tell the liberals this because they were being very impolite. Um, I do think that, honestly, Radley Balko, um, his, his influence on the issue of caring about the police... In libertarian circles, it's huge, and kind of in the the you know the world at large, it's it's huge. Um, and I guess he got his start in like '05 and '06 um, at Cato and then Reason and stuff. Um, and I know, I mean, it, I, I feel I think it came up before that. Um, I just it's becoming more and more an issue, and um, I think libertarians can, in some ways, take credit for for being on the ball before some people, but also as good self-critical but not in a malice sort of way people, we should be like, well, we maybe should have been on this a little faster. Um, well, I, 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 yeah. I mean, I, I'm, I'm completely self-critical in that respect. I mean, I, it took me a, a long time to kind of come around and realize, you know, the, the, the police, it sounds silly to say it, but the police are, are really the, the sort of uh, sharp end of the stick of the state, you know. I mean, that's that's where that's where it all that's what it all comes down to. The enforcement, the enforcement arm, is is the one that that uh, you know has the most direct contact with with actual human beings. The bureaucrats and you know walled away in, in ivory palaces in Washington don't don't actually touch us except through the mails, you know. But but it's the cops that are the the ones that are the most direct agents of tyranny. No, I'm. Not I don't want to like turn this back on you, but why do you think um, it ta it took that long for you or for other libertarians? Is it, is it because I, I think there's something to I've read some critiques of libertarians lately that there's a little something to it, which says that you know we are obsessed with the feds um, and mm. we don't we kind of ignore local stuff. But mm. I think that a lot of people, I mean the you know the news in general is always stressing federal national issues. Mm -hmm. And local stuff isn't really a concern. Local stuff is a cat in a tree down the mm -hmm. street sort of things. 
Yeah, um, I think there's, there's something to all those, all those things. But, you know, there's an ideological component, too, Lucy. I mean, uh, we've always thought of ourselves, I think, as uh, at least my direction was, okay, I was, you know, a, a constitutionalist, and then mm -hmm. I became a, a so-called minarchist, you know, and then finally you let go of that. But there's an ordering in which you let go of definitely mental uh, attachment to aspects of the state. And for me, the last thing to go was was the service of security provision and, and justice and enforcement, that sort of thing. So that's the last thing to go, you know, in, in your ideological apparatus. So you have probably a greater degree of tolerance for the thing that you just only recently cast aside, you know? That makes um, sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But, but, but over time, you know, of course, I mean, I can't, well, let, let me just tell you that, that there's a book that had a huge influence on me. It's called, uh, uh, by Clarence Darrow, called, uh, Something, something evil. I forget now the, the name of it. Uh, but, but, but he isolates the police power of the state as this, and the jails and, and justice system as the single most evil aspect of the state. And I realized I had it completely reversed all along. Like the first part of the state that you should sort of mentally uh, detach yourself from is is the the enforcement apparatus and the police, because that's it's the night watchman who's the guy who guards the the, the camp, you know, and shoots you when you try to run away. Um, so I had it, I had it kind of upside down, I think. But but you know, I'm hardly alone in this respect. I mean, you know, hundreds of years have gone by in classical liberal ideology where people did not believe that security could be a market function. Um, I think that like I don't want to like God knows I'm not like let's kick out all the minarchists, um, you know, for purity's sake or anything. But I think that is often a minarchist flaw. And the person who made me realize this, Balco, who's one of my heroes, does a lot of real world practical, you know, moderate sounding, even if in his heart, I don't really know, you know, how radical he is, but he does the reporting real world stuff to convince the people who have never heard the word libertarian that the cops are out of line. Yeah. Um, but a person who, who changed my mind and actually made me officially drop the minarchist thing for good was Anthony Gregory, who I saw uh -huh. give a speech in 2010 about, um, well, he had, two, he had two speeches at this independent institute conference. Um, and one was with delightful just trashing of um, the Bill of Rights for being, you know, vague language and not radical enough. And the other was about war. And I had been reading a lot of history stuff um, and thinking about war, but there was something that finally clicked with, you know, the, the you know, the, the minarchists want to leave the war and like cops and courts and the life and death most unsubtle and literal freedom or not thing, and those are the most dangerous. They really are. And something about that finally I was like, oh, of course. <laughs> you know, this is another factor here too, and it, it's, it's fairly interesting. That people don't entirely realize this, but the financial crisis of 2008 put a tremendous fiscal strain on local budgets, and the police became tax collectors uh, for their own little miniature estates over which mm -hmm. they you know, sort of ruled. And also they had pension programs that they had to fund. So it became, you know, like like uh, like the Middle Ages. I mean, uh, you know, in the Middle Ages, the tax collectors, uh, you know, worked on on a kind of commission system. You know, they go out and shake down people and be able to keep half of whatever they earned. And that's ex essentially what happened with with the police since 2008. They just began to kind of uh, become revenue agents, basically. Yeah, and that's and, um... and became very cool. Uh, I was going to say that that's kind of um, a way, an, an inroad to making, I think, other people maybe be aware that, that cops aren't so good. Um, you know, like, libertarians get criticized for, like, oh, you're caring about sort of small issues that, you know, a rich, middle-aged white man cares about, and, like, speeding tickets or speed traps, red light cameras, um, anything where it is just this little, small financial thing. Um, but it, it, of course, all, it all ties together, as, as, as you said. Um, and um, Balco, again, did this, reason, did this long piece about... Um, uh, he, he went down to um, um, Missouri and, 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 you know, where all the, the horrible uh, Ferguson controversy and anger has been happening since that shooting last month. Um, and he just reported on what he's calling, you know, the, the criminalization of poverty where... There are all these court costs and these other fees that 
if you're if you're lucky enough to be wealthier, then you can pay to make a fee go away. But for someone who has less money, someone who absolutely can't miss a day of work, um, there's this whole element where it's going to add up, and you can you can ruin somebody's life very easily with a couple of fines they can't pay. Um, so it's just one of those things. Law and order has all these different tendrils in, in all these different areas, and it's one of those things that if you start to pay attention, I think almost everybody would start to think something was not right here. Uh, Lucy, that is really a very poignant comment. I, I'm now recalling there was a time when I decided to fight a ticket, which is the dumbest thing ever, um, and I sat all day in a, in a court, and uh, it, it changed many aspects of my outlook on life. I mean, I saw how people were being looted and, and pillaged and having their lives ruined by this, by this judge, but I also saw something else, and that was the way in which the white bourgeoisie you know, basically find ways around the system because they, they, they know the cop or they know the judge, they have a good attorney or whatever, and the, the real victims of, 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 of this abusive system were, uh, f just from my day in, in, in sitting in the court, were almost entirely poor blacks. Mm -hmm. And uh, I realized that these, these human beings were being used as fodder, you know, in, in a very cruel system, and, and it shocked me, really. I mean, I had a sense, like I would look at, there, there was glass windows in, in the room, and I had a sense that if I took a cinder block and busted out the glass and invited all of them to leave, that our community would be um, vastly better off rather than having them caged and pillaged and looted and coerced by this cruel system. It was a, a weird moment of, of, I guess I could say, anarchist radicalism that was going on in my head at that moment. <laughs> Sometimes these thoughts just come, and that sounds like the place for them. So, sadly, crime, not the place crime. to act on it. <laughs> Yeah, right. Might not so, be able to get out of that one, uh, even with uh, yeah. Yeah, no, bad news. Well, you know, and 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 you know, the excuse from our hangout actually is, and we had to have a good excuse for it, is to talk <laughs> about young adult fiction. And one of the things you find in Divergent and, and Hunger Games and Catching Fire and these these sort of things is a very prominent role for the enforcement agents, because in movies, the way to to illustrate the might and power and and despotism of the rulers is is through the enforcement you know so uh, uh, you know that plays a factor here too and that's why that's why hunger games seems to my mind anyway looks so much like the world in which we live what do you think okay well i'll tell you a little bit about um, the horrible guardian column that i responded to for rare recently um, because this is a um, this guy it's it was so it, 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 it should have been a joke. It was so. It was so. It was such self-parody. Um, he basically writes that The Hunger Games, Divergent, um, The Giver, which is from the '90s, but I guess they just made a movie of it. All of these, um, you know, dystopian uh, fictions for sort of younger audiences. Um, you know, young adult. Uh, the Giver was kind of middle school age. I read it ages ago. Um, that the enemy in all of them is the state, and somehow, therefore, that translates to what this uh, fellow called a right libertarian thing, um, and he kind of was calling it propaganda and was mourning like the um, the decline of, I don't know, more left, like, corporate control type dystopias in sci-fi. Um, and at the end of it, he literally suggests progressive parents, like, maybe reconsider allowing your children to read these books, and <laughs> it was completely horrifying because it honestly, the, the, the lack of... Um, the, the suggesting that people shouldn't read these books was actually more horrifying than even you know any ideological warfare going on. I think a, a leftist could take the Hunger Games and could get some some of their own lessons out of it. You know, it could, it, they could use it to reaffirm certain things they believe. I do think that um, that there are a lot of libertarian uh, lessons in it. Um, there's you know, there's the state, there's um, the main character goes poaching all the time because the markets are controlled. There's mention of little sort of market stalls that are, you know, not, they're illicit. Um, and later there's all this stuff about sort of keeping your principles, you know, they, they make the character fight to the death to, with these other people. And unless, you know, unless she's in a circumstance of being directly attacked, she doesn't go around, you know, killing people to win. She, she tries as hard as she can to kind of keep her morals. And later in the series, there's, you know, the full-out war, this revolution that, um, you know, it's justified in that this is a horrible, tyrannical state, 
but there really pulls no punches in talking about this war is going to be awful. And most interesting of all to me, the government you may replace your tyrannical one with may be exactly the same. Um, so there's some stuff beyond, oh, the mean, powerful people are being mean to me. Um, which is why, I, which is why I like them, um, and I actually think the movies were turned were even better than the books. Um, I guess it's what a, it's a little shocking to think that like a century ago, that the left and and liberalism would have been uh, was almost entirely anti anti statist. I mean, they they understood that the source of despotism in the world is 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 this is the state with its censorship and militarism and and so on. I mean, it's just bizarre that that. In 2014, that uh, that you would get this article like the Guardian, you know, it, it would somehow see the state as as the as the friend of, of liberty rather than its opposite. Well, I don't know if that uh, writer is very interested in liberty, um, but he, he wasn't even doing the traditional liberal, twisted optimism thing where it's like, well, sure, some states have been bad, but you know, darn it, next time we'll get it right. He seemed to be objecting on some sort of horrifying principle that the state should ever be the enemy in a story at all. And from a story standpoint, the state is a great enemy because it's the meanest guy around, it's the biggest guy around, it's the guy that can kick your door in and take away your loved ones. Um, you know, and I mentioned Star Wars in my piece, like who does he root for? Um, moral quandaries about blowing the Death Star up notwithstanding. Um, you know, does he root for the Empire because they're how can you even react to fiction like this? Much, I mean, the real world is, I suppose, another matter. You can justify all sorts of things, but in a fiction sense, it was so, it was so baffling. Um, I had to write in response because I was actually so irritated I couldn't help myself. Um. <laughs> yeah, I hadn't read the article yet, but I've, I've, I've read a, a few responses uh, to it. Um, what, what? Let me ask you, Lucy. What, what is your sense of what it means for us socially, culturally, politically? That these that these movies, these books are are so popular among young people. Do you see that as um, uh, a foreshadowing of good things, or just an indication of a cultural shift? What what's your feeling about that? Um, that, 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 that's something to consider now. Um, sort of the, the teen um, younger audience sensation before all the Hunger Games was, of course, Twilight. <laughs> which I read and, and, and hated, as many people do, because it was just sort of a soppy love story. Um, and there's nothing wrong with that kind of thing, you know? It, it has its place in the world, and it's appealing to especially younger people for reasons. Um, but c comparing, you know, sort of the lessons of that kind of thing, like, um, you know, you get everything you want, and everything's lovey-dovey after, you know, not that much drama. Um, but The Hunger Games, I mean, spoiler alert, um, you know, in the third book, when and all the things are over, our main character clearly has PTSD from what's happened. It's a very oddly real, like trying for a certain type of realism. And as I said before, the whole the state, you know, the a justified rebellion can still be this nightmare. There's there's some big issues there, and if that's appealing to you know 15 year old girls, that's I think that's a good thing. Now whether that you know is bringing in the grand libertarian moment as um, people like my former Reason colleagues like to like to say is, is just around the corner. I don't know. Um, you know, dystopian novels, which I love, have been popular for a long time. Um, 1984 and Brave New World and um, Anthem and all that good stuff. Um, and, you know, they were reactions to, to uh, 20th century totalitarianism. Um, I don't know what it speaks to. I'd like to say, you know, I'm generally optimistic about it, but I don't, I don't know if I have any grand hopes about it. It might just be a, a literary trend. Um, I don't know. We do, live, we do live in in digital times. I mean, most of, I mean, the, there's a generation now being raised entirely uh, on 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 in an online culture that's basically a product of of anarchism. You know the app economy and uh, the gaming culture and and social media and everything is an entirely a product of spontaneous order, not not the state. And that's very different from previous that's generations true. who who lived in a basically in a state-based world. I mean, you know, I I was born 
um, you know, and at, at, in many ways at the height of the Cold War, where the state was the center of, of all all politics and all all thought and and social and cultural happenings. So that was the critical thing. There's nothing like that anymore. The center of our world is 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 being generated spontaneously through a global culture of uh, digital engagement. And so I guess I guess I probably have to count myself among among the, the utopians in, in that sense, mainly because there's been a structural technological change in the last That's couple true. of decades, don't you think? There is, though, um, the, 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 the sort of um, menacing drawbacks, of course, which is, you know, the NSA and, and the total lack of privacy. Um, though I have, my, I, you know, I have my hopes that that can be fought, um, but I guess one thing I'd worry about with the internet, you know, and, and technology saving us all is that people a little bit younger than I am generally don't even think about it. The internet is just like this second skin, um, which is great. Um, and it, it, it may be, you know, I know some people like um, Harris Kenny, uh, who I was with at Reason, and he went off to do tech things, have this, this sense that just like that's, that's the sphere that's going to save us all. Um, and, it, and and sort of like you know the state will be will just become so inconsequential, not some grand overthrow. It'll just sort of be we can do anything now. So don't even you know you over there withering away. But I don't know. I don't know. I think that the internet um, and technology is a bit more double edged than I would like it to to think it is. I think that there's some dangers that. If we all get used to being spied on all the time, which we already sort of have, there's there there, there is a drawback. Um, I am an optimist, I swear. I just am trying. You know, I don't know if I can prove my optimism. That's always been my sure. problem. You know, I, I understand exactly what you mean, and I, I think there is something. It's, it's interesting to think about what the future looks like in a world with an anachronistic state that's basically regulating all the technologies of the past. And, and and history moving forward, you know, with a kind of a globalist anarchist spirit, increasingly dominating our lives and our our culture. But we still have this gigantic apparatus out there, this leviathan, this taxing us, and mm -hmm. and trying to force us into a central plan. Uh, it is intriguing to think of what that looks like. Um, it strikes me that that all everybody needs to make a more conscious effort to kind of free their own lives. I mean, that, that's. Um, that, the, that in the future there's going to be a, a, a sort of division between the compliant and the non-compliant. And that we see that already emerging, I think. We're probably just at the beginning stages of that. That's, that's my own feeling about it. Um, that sounds good to me. My, um, my one problem is, and I don't feel like I'm, you know, I, I haven't done this yet enough in my life, but again, going back to my, uh, my hero, uh, Radley Balko, he really despises politics, you know. I think he'd like to sit in Nashville and drink bourbon and uh, watch country music, which sounds great. Um, I, and I, I also I aspire to the fact that, and a lot of reason people are like this as well, but Balco has done the most concrete good in the world, um, where, like, you'd love to ignore politics and free yourself and all that good stuff, um, but there are people who can't because they are, you know, absolutely in the jaws of the state. It reminds me of... Um, Wendy McElroy's most recent book, where she has a whole chapter about um, like the two different Henry David Thoreaus. There's the one who, you know, said you got to throw yourself in front of the state. The one who went to jail, albeit for a day, over the um, the Mexican American War, I think. Yeah. Um, yes. And then there's the the one who came out of jail and went uh, berry picking with the boys from the village and looked around and said the state was nowhere to be found. I mean, it he, he it's like the whole. He encompasses like each, you know, each option, um, and the question of which which one to be, I guess, is that's that's been something I've been thinking about before I could have made the Thoreau comparison. I've been thinking about that for since I was like fourteen. Um, I'm so excited about it uh, about that, you know, about that book because uh, you know that I've. I've I've never read it. I'm embarrassed to admit that, but I've never read it. But in the next couple of days, I have a deadline actually to write a uh, a book summary. Uh, an evaluation for Leslie Fair books of Walden. So I'm really looking forward to digging into it and, and gaining my own impressions of that book. I haven't ever tackled uh, Walden. I know people dislike it. Um, civil dis disobedience. There is the one sentence where he said he's not. He says he's not a no government man, and I like, 
pretend that's not there. Um, <laughs> but there's like, I mean, some of this beans is like anti-state poetry. Um, you know, there's a there's a couple lines in there that if I ever like got a tattoo, I would want I would want it. You know, um, I'm blanking on the lines, but they're really good. Yeah. yeah. It ends with "I will breathe after my own fashion." Um, it's it's good. Um, I actually haven't read a lot of the Liberty stuff I'm supposed to, which is my shameful admittance. I did happen to read uh, Wendy's book and a couple of other ones, but um, I have some holes in my general uh, e econ knowledge. Econ's a little trickier for me. Lucy, it's okay. I mean, you know, I, I've recently admitted um, uh, publicly that I'm, I'm only now reading Atlas Shrugged, if you can believe it. I haven't read Atlas Shrugged. I tried. That's, uh, that's the worst part. I tried, and I was like, oh, I can't. I've read Anthem. You know, that's our slim Ayn Rand. Yeah, Rand is also, tricky, man. Rand is tricky. Yeah, yeah, Rand is tricky. It's, um, uh, Anthem's in the public domain, so it's a little more accessible. But <laughs> uh, Atlas, I'm about a third of the way through it, and I'm, I'm, I'm impressed. Uh, but there's some laugh-out-loud moments for me, too, you know. So Sounds it's been a, kind of a mixed experience, but, but, but fun. But I, the best thing about reading the literature that you're, you're supposed to have read that you, that you haven't read is that it gives you the kind of the right to talk about it. That's, <laughs> that's the number one benefit. So. <laughs> I should get on that then. Yeah, that's right. So, Lucy, it's really been fun hanging out with you, and thanks oh, for, again, for your podcast on Liberty.me. It's, it's really popular, um, and I enjoy it very, very much and all your involvement in, in our online community and all your wonderful work. And it's beautiful to see you again, and I, I hope to see you again very soon. I would like that. Thank you for having me. It was great. Take care, Lucy. Bye-bye. The police, all of which has come to a, an end, essentially, since 2008. Um, yeah, I, I don't know my libertarian history is fully. I have some missing spots. It's usually the 90s where I was, you know, a kid. <laughs> um, and also don't tell the liberals this because they were being very impolite. Um, I do think that... Honestly, Radley Balko, um, his his influence on the issue of caring about the police in libertarian circles, it's huge, and kind of in the the you know the world at large, it's it's huge. Um, and I guess he got his start. Lucy Steigerwald, it's so nice to see you. It's lovely to be here. We met one time, I guess, um, but this is really sort of our more more or less our second meeting, right? I believe so, yes. But I listen um, to your podcast on Liberty.me, which is hugely popular. I'm glad. I'm I'm glad that you approve. That's um, <laughs> I like the approval of my libertarian betters, even if that offends the left libertarians with its latent bossism. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> bossism, yeah. It's a funny word. Yeah. The 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 most obvious uh, life and death and uh, freedom or not issues are kind of important, most important to me. Right. Well, you know, uh, Lucy, there was it wasn't too long ago when libertarians weren't really talking about uh, cops and uh, the uh, police issues and things like that that much. I mean, the, it's, this has become, this is a rather new thing. Uh, I, don't, I don't know, you're, you're probably not old enough to remember this, but, but I remember a time when sort of minimalist state ideology kind of created a sort of tolerance on the part of libertarians towards what is a left libertarian and it's hard to kind of put your finger on it entirely I guess it's a certain sensitivity to certain causes and issues and things like that but uh, yeah there's such diversity it, it seems almost wrong to kind of you know clump them all, all into one category and say oh the left libertarians think such and such you know there seems yeah, like a lot of diversity there I've been accused of being a left libertarian just because I said I prioritized um, the prison and cops and war stuff. Um, some uh, not very charming libertarian on the internet once told me I was left because of that, but I don't think that that followed at all. It's just that you know, it is a funny word. I'm kind of okay with it. I'm not gonna lie. But well, yeah, I know what you mean. <laughs> I I feel this way of uh, the left libertarians. It's easy to caricature their views until you actually read the writings, and then. Yeah, it's pretty interesting stuff. You know, I like I like the challenge. I don't think of myself as a right libertarian in any case. So. No, me either. I don't like having a wing. I love the left libertarians. I met a lot at um, Students for Liberty in February. Uh, they're fantastic. Um, I don't. I'm not with them. But as as you say, I don't feel like a right libertarian by any means either. 
I don't really yeah. get the picking a wing thing. Right. Well, the other the other thing is that sometimes people say, 